Devin and I got married. Um, I was still in seminary. I was finishing up my last semester distance ed. I had moved up to Ohio to get married to her from Virginia Beach in the middle of winter, all for love. Uh, I have never regretted it. Um, but I didn't have a job at that time. She was working. She was working through the state, caring for two handicapped children in their home. And so uh, she was making the money. Shortly after I graduated, I got a job at a church, and she was still making more money than I was. But um, we bought our first house by the skin of our teeth. Like, we had looked and looked and looked and prayed and looked, and then right when we gave up, it's like, that's when it happens sometimes with the Lord. Like, this house popped up. I was like, this might be it. Got in by the skin of our teeth. Um, didn't have a rental history because I was out of state when, we, when I moved up here and we got married. We were then living with my in-laws for the first six months. And so I was in a new position and so nobody wanted to give us a mortgage. I can't understand why. Um, so the only option to us was an arm loan or a balloon loan as they're sometimes called. And everybody here shaking their head like, oh my gosh. Even as a young, dumb 20-something year old, I knew that that was not a great idea. I just knew it was our only option. And so we trusted our mortgage lender. He's a great guy. He's a Christian. He actually is a member of Providence and a great, great guy. Um, and he's like, we're going to get you in the door with this, but I will not let you go beyond the two years when it's going to blow up and like be incredibly expensive. He said, we will refinance you before the two years is up. I was like, great. Okay. No problem. So a little time goes by. And Devin ends up quitting her job with the state to uh, come on staff at that same church in a, in a part-time role. And we really felt like the, the Lord was calling her to do that, even though it meant less money. We're like, trust the Lord, it's going to work out. And it was fine. Then we got pregnant with Josiah. And um, then we were faced with the question that many of you have faced, like, do, does mom stay home? Does dad stay home? Do we get child care? Do, how does this work? Do we keep working? And so we prayed and sought wisdom, and it didn't make any sense on paper, but Devin really felt, and I really felt like she was supposed to stay home. And so we did that with a full heart. And so Devin quit her part-time job at the church. We made even less money, but okay. And so shortly after that, Josiah is born and uh, going okay. But then we realized, oh shoot, we have that dumb arm loan. <laughs> And then the next realization was, I don't know if we're going to get approved for another loan now that we're making less money than we were when we barely got it to begin with. And so the panic started to set in a little bit. But the other interesting thing is, did I mention that this was in the fall of 2007? When there just happened to be this little thing called the housing market crash, when they weren't just giving out mortgages anymore. And so the panic set in a little bit more, like we have a new baby, we may lose our house. We have no idea what we're gonna do. And I remember back then feeling really stuck, not knowing what we were gonna do. And I remember having the thoughts and feelings like, Lord, what the heck? Like, we really thought you were leading us to do this. We thought you were leading us for Devin to quit her job. We thought you were leading us to buy this house. Wait a minute, God, this is your fault. Ever been there? You led us here, didn't you? Now, this is just one example of many in my life where I feel like the Lord led me in a certain way only to feel more stuck and to, be, to go from like a bad to worse situation. Don't raise your hand, but I think some of you can relate to that too. Like, Lord, I thought if I had this conversation with so-and-so, it would all be better. I thought if I made this business decision, you were gonna honor it. But I think so that's something we can all relate to. Sometimes as we follow the Lord, we think like, man, I feel worse off than I was before. How did I get here? Lord, where are you? What is going on? Now, we were able to keep the house. And so it's like, okay, Lord, you came through. And it wasn't like somebody showed up one day and said, I'm gonna pay off your mortgage. It was like not even a great solution, but the Lord was faithful and kept us in the house. But I have situations in my life where looking back now, I still don't see the resolve. I still don't see how the Lord's gonna make this work out or what the Lord was up to when he led me in those ways or had me in those situations. Can you relate? I think many of us are still waiting, <laughs> thinking one day this is gonna make sense, right, Lord? 
But right now, we don't really see it as clearly. And so last week in Exodus chapter 13, we saw the Lord leading his people out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, but not leading them into the promised land in the most expeditious way, right? And we threw up this map last week, um, and it just kind of shows where scholars think they traveled, but they're not really sure. Some of that has been lost to time and what the different places listed in Scripture actually were. Um, but he's leading them in this way because he has unfinished business, particularly with Pharaoh, but also with his people. And so chapter 13 ended by telling us that they, they encamped on the edge of the wilderness. And so turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 14. If you're using the Bible that was in the back, it's on page 62. But I'd love for you to follow along with me, if you would. Okay, we can throw that map back up there, if we could, please. Chapter 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Phiharoth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. And so like I just said, scholars that really have tried to unpack like exactly what route did the Israelites take in, especially over the 40 years, it's not super clear, but what we know is clear is they started moving out of Egypt. God had them wait on the border of the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. And then what chapter 14 just tells us is the Lord calls them to turn back, and then position themselves with their backs to the sea. Okay? And so it doesn't seem like a great idea to have your back against something that you can't cross. I mean, we have lots of colloquialisms for this in our language. It's like painting yourself into a corner. Ever been there? Maybe you stain the deck and you're like, oh man, I should have started on that end. Between a rock and a hard place, up the creek without a paddle. And I'm going to date myself. Despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. We get in these places where we're stuck. We're like, this probably wasn't the best idea. And yet the Lord leads them to this place where they are hemmed in with their backs to the sea. But not only that, look at verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and they did so. And it's like, wait, 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 what? God, you're doing this on purpose? You're getting us stuck in this place on purpose where we have no other option, and you're going to make, you're going to cause Pharaoh's heart to be hardened again, and he's going to pursue us to kill us? Like, What? You're getting us stuck on purpose. And look at the last part of that verse. And they did so. Pharaoh's going to think we're morons and we're idiots and we can't read a map. And because you just have us wandering around and turning back. And God said, yeah. I want you right here. And they did so. Verse 5. And the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, that they booked it out of Egypt. The mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them at camped at the sea by pi Heroth in front of Baal Zephon. Remember that Egypt is like the world power of the time. The Egyptian chariot was the state of the art weapon of the time. And we have some pictures. Uh, it's depicted in a lot of Egyptian art and hieroglyphics and, and things that they have unearthed since that time. The chariot was a big deal. 
Egypt was feared because of the chariot and their army. The Egyptian chariot could hold three people. Archers would ride in the chariot because they could be mobile, taking people out. And so it just told us that Pharaoh gets in his special chariot. Then 600 chosen chariots go with him. And on top of that, all of the other chariots go with him. And all of the other forces and armies of Egypt go with Pharaoh after these Israelites hunting them in the wilderness. These are the special forces of Egypt. This is SEAL Team 6 and all the other numbers. This is the Rangers, Delta Force. Anybody that we've got is going after this people group. It's like seeing these come at you. We got another picture. For those of you that don't know, that don't know those are F-35 Lightning IIs, the most advanced fighter, pilot, fighter jet in the world. It's the equivalent of what the Israelites were facing that day. Imagine seeing these things coming at you with every other army and force that the U.S. has at their disposal coming to get you and take you out. Now remember the night that the Israelites left Egypt? God had told them to ask their Egyptian neighbors for silver and gold, right? And God gave them favor. Their Egyptian neighbors started unloading all their silver and gold on them. And it says in that verse, it says that, so the Israelites plundered Egypt. And that word there is on purpose. It's a militaristic conquering word. It's what you would do to a defeated people. God had defeated the Egyptians and the Israelites plundered them on their way out. That's just a couple chapters before. And then verse 8 just told us that the Israelites had gone out of Egypt defiantly. Other translations translate it this way. They say they were marching out boldly. The Israelites were marching out. They left with fists raised in defiance. Another translation says they were leaving confidently. Another translation says they were going out triumphantly. In other words... The Israelites left Egypt that night with some swagger. The cocky kid on the basketball court just struts off. The Israelites left Egypt that night with some attitude after seeing their God kick the rear ends of all of the Egyptian false gods. They left with their hands in the air, their fists in the air, their head up, plundering the Egyptians. But now look at them. Verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. Can you imagine how terrifying that must have been? You could just see the smoke, the dust cloud rising from, the, from Egypt as the forces of the Egyptian army, all of them are coming towards you and your back is against the sea. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And so they get this bitter sarcasm, right? Like, oh, great. Would have been better to die in Egypt. We told you this would happen. So they've lost the swagger a little bit. We talked about last week how quickly we forget what God has done for us. And so they're freaking out. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Number one, man, God has done a work in Moses' heart. That's not the Moses we met a while ago. The human response in the face of danger is what? Either fight or flight. Like, I'm out of here. But God's call through Moses to his people in that moment was neither. 
It was stand. Trust me. I'm the one who got you out of Egypt. I'm the one who led you here with your back to the sea. Stand. Verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh and his chariots. And so God tells Moses the plan. He tells him exactly what is to happen, exactly what he has in mind. Verse 19, then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. This is absolutely an incredible miracle of God. And I tried to find some artwork online to show you, but all of it is just so lame compared to what this would have actually looked like. If you've seen Ten Commandments, I've told you I love that movie. I need to watch the rest of it um, again. Uh, this whole scene is just awesome. Even for the terrible special effects of when Ten Commandments was made, it is breathtaking. To put yourself there that night with your back to the sea and to see God come down in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. It's what we call a theophany or maybe even a Christophany. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of God. Just like in the burning bush when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, God came down in the fire on that bush. And it just told us the angel of the Lord, which is often likened to Jesus in the flesh before Jesus became as a man. Um, this is one of those instances, and we're gonna see it again in a second. But look at verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. What did he make the sea? Dry land. And the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on what? Dry ground. The waters being a wall to them on their right, on their right hand and on their left. They were protected on each side by a wall of water and they were protected in the rear by that pillar of fire and cloud blocking the Egyptian army from pursuing them. God had them hemmed in. There was no other way out but to trust him by walking through that sea. The Egyptian army couldn't flank them. They couldn't get around them, couldn't get to them. But God said, you gotta walk through the sea. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord, here it is, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down, how awesome is that, on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. It's like, you know, you ever been mudding or in a car and you get in the mud or even heavy snow, thick snow, and it just builds up on your wheels and you get stuck and it's clunky and you just can't operate the vehicle as well? It's what I picture happening here where the ground had been dry for the Israelites. The Lord removes the pillar of cloud and fire and allows the Egyptians to then begin pursuing the Israelites. And as soon as they get into there, it starts getting muddy, bogging them down. And then look at it. The Egyptians realize what's going on. End of 25. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. It's like, hello, the lights come on again after the 10 plagues. They're like, oh, duh, that's right. We don't want to mess with this guy. And they freak out. They say, let us flee. They go into a panic and so God has done this, so he does this several times in the Old Testament. In Joshua 10, when the Israelites are facing the Ammonites, the, the text says that he throws the Ammonites into a panic and they just don't know what to do. And then in Judges, when Gideon is facing the Midianites, God does the same thing. He incites a panic in the camp so that the Midianites start attacking each other. And then in 1 Samuel, twice against the Philistines, God incites this panic among the people. And so we see God do it here with the Egyptians. They start freaking out. Let us flee. Verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
And there, here I did give you a screenshot. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Once again, God did it. He had a plan. He executed it. He was the one that delivered his people. He's the only one that could deliver his people. They were in an impossible situation that he had led them into to once again show his great power to the wicked and to them that all would know that he alone is the Lord, that he alone is the true God, that he alone is the faithful one to his people. But how many of you realize that delivering them from their slavery in Egypt wasn't the point? God helping Devin and I keep our house wasn't the point. The exodus, God delivering his people from Egypt is meant to point us over and over and over again to the ultimate deliverance that every one of us needs. And because of that, it reminds us that we can trust him for that ultimate deliverance that each one of us needs. The Israelites walked through the destructive power of the sea on dry ground. And then they watched the Egyptian army receive the judgment of God for their wickedness and rebellion against him and his people. But here's the thing. All of us have painted ourselves into the corner. All of us deserve an even worse destruction than the Egyptians did. All of us are stuck. And yet, the Lord has made a way out. You and I can walk through the judgment waters of God on dry ground because Jesus threw himself into the water of God's wrath and endured it on our behalf. He took the wrath of God that we deserved on himself. He let the waters come in over him. In Mark chapter 10, uh, Jesus is approaching the time of his death and he has just told his disciples for at least the third time what's to happen. Like, guys, we're gonna go to Jerusalem. I'm gonna be betrayed. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna rise again three days. He's trying to make it pretty clear to them and they're still not getting it. And in verse 38, he tells them that he's gonna drink a cup that they can't really drink. And he's referring to the Old Testament where the cup, drinking the cup that God pours out is drinking the wrath of God. I'm gonna drink a cup that I don't think you can drink. And then he says, I'm gonna be baptized with a baptism you can't be. Again, pointing to a destruction of the wrath of God being poured out upon him. And so if you aren't standing in faith in what Jesus has done for you, if you're trying to figure it out by either fight or by flight, like I'm just trying to dodge, trying to do more good than I do bad, trying to justify myself and God, I've done all of this, or I'm just not gonna think about it right now and I, I don't really like to think about it. 
That's not going to work because your back is still against that flood and it's coming for you. But in his great love for us, he sent us the deliverer. He sent us the one that makes a path through the judgment of God's water. He sent his son into the world to deliver us. And so all of the other situations in life we encounter, and we talk about this a lot. I talked about it a lot last week, that the things the Lord allows in our life are actually acts of his love for us, and they keep us dependent on him by reminding us that we can't do it in ourselves, and we need his help. And so Jesus gets, his, he gets the Israelites with their backs against the sea. They're stuck to remind them again that you can't do this on your own. I'm the only one. And so all of these other situations, we can often turn what we read to be into like, God, just get me out of the situation. He's like, wait, 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 wait. All of those situations I'm walking through are pointing you to the fact that only I can deliver you from the situation that you are all in. That you are all stuck without me. And that's why Christmas is such a big deal. Is this was his plan from the beginning. It is his plan that he initiated. Because we would have never turned to him. He's like, I got it. I got it. I'm not only going to tell you what I'm going to do ahead of time, I'm going to show you over and over and over again how I'm coming to deliver you. And I'm going to prove myself faithful over and over and over again because I know you all forget so often. And I'm going to get you into situations where you have no other opportunity but to turn to me and I'm there for you. And so that is why you and I can stand when the different life situations pop up that we're like, God, this has gone from bad to worse. I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand why that thing happened 20 years ago. But Lord, I'm gonna to choose to stand and trust that you're the one who fights for me, that you're the one who has made me right with God. Help me, Lord, to rest in that. Would you bow with me? I wanna invite you just to take a moment And if the Lord has been stirring you, I don't, I don't pretend that everybody here is a Christian. No way. And so if you're a Christian here and you've placed your faith in Jesus, would you pray right now that if anybody's in this room or listening that doesn't know him, that the Lord would just open their hearts and enable them to respond in faith? You've heard it several times today that Jesus loves you. He didn't have to do anything. He could have let us all go and, des and get the destruction that we all deserve and that we all have earned. And yet he said no. No. He gave us himself. And not from a distance, he emptied himself and condescended, and not just to be, come down to earth and become a king and become powerful and convince everybody to follow him. He came in the most helpless, vulnerable way he could as a baby, dependent on others because of his love for us. And so if you're here and you have never responded to him, you've never wanted to, maybe you've never heard it before. But he came and suffered the death that you and I deserve for our sin so that we could be set free, be adopted into his family and have hope for eternity. And so that's his invitation to you Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Put your spirit in me. Change me from the inside out. God, I want to follow you. I don't want to try to fight, and I don't want to try to run away anymore. God, I feel like I'm just stuck in life right now. There are situations I cannot get out of. Would you save me, Jesus? And he promises that he will. Thank you, Lord. For those who... You love the Lord. You've seen him be faithful so many times in the past, but right now you're in another one of those spots where you feel stuck. 
You don't know what you're going to do. You don't know the answer. You don't know the decision. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, flood each of us with your peace because of the reminder that you've got us. You've got us. No matter how these situations turn out right now, they are temporary. But we are yours for eternity, and you are with us in the midst of it. And we thank you for it, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Amen. The very next chapter, the whole chapter basically is a song. It's Moses singing to the Lord a song of thanks and gratitude of what they have just witnessed before their very eyes. And so that is the same principle of why we often sing at the end of service. It's a response to being reminded of what God has done. It's a welling up of gratitude and praise for what he's done. So we're going to sing one more time before we go. Um, But as they come, listen to just a little bit of what Moses says. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. And so that is why we can sing to him today. So let's stand. Feeling nice to share this a little bit. I I think sometimes uh, we can read the word and hear messages, and it's like, Jesus died for you and rose again and you have heaven, so suck it up. And that's the bottom line is like, that's why we have hope. If we don't have hope beyond this life, then it's a joke and we're just trying to make ourselves feel better. But that is the anchor of our hope is that he rose again and there's life beyond this. I'm not, you get that part. Um, uh, Help me, Lord. Sin has effects, and sin damages, and sin traumatizes. And I want you to know that the Lord sees it and he cares. And so when we talk about God had them in this situation, or God had me in this situation and it worked out or it didn't work out, work out there's a whole lot of nuance there. And sometimes when we read these Bible stories, we see the miraculous as we're supposed to see. And, we, and so many people get in trouble because they dumb down the miraculous. And no, these are miracles that God actually did. But sometimes when we read Daniel in the lion's den, we think Daniel probably never had nightmares after that. Or Jonah, you don't think he had flashbacks of being in the belly of the whale for three days? I mean, name one of those stories where I just got to believe these people, God was faithful and they saw him do amazing things. But you got to believe they bore some scars from that. And the Lord's promises, he's with us in that. And we spent all summer going through the Psalms, which is that of people saying, God, I believe you're there, but this is a mess. And so as you go into Christmas week, and I know there's grief of people that won't be around the table this year because of death and loss and illness or broken relationships or whatever, or there's a loneliness there that you dread every year. These are the effects of the brokenness of sin. And while you can have hope that Jesus wants to be the anchor for everything, he also says, but it's okay to grieve. And I'm with you on that too. A bruised reed I'm not gonna break and a smoldering wick, somebody who feels like they're at their last. He's like, I'm not gonna snuff you out. Blessed are you who are mourned because you will be comforted. Blessed are you who are poor, which means just an emptiness in every way. Yours is the kingdom of God. And so as we go today, be reminded that that's an act of his great love for you too is that he's with you in it. 
And one more line from Moses' song. He says, you have led in your steadfast love. Steadfast means faithful, never giving up, ever pursuing love. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. And how did he redeem us? How did he buy us back? The cost of his own life. How will he not give us all things? He's with you in it. God bless you as you go. May he flood you with his peace because of this spirit that lives within you. Amen.